2020 on the 15th of April 2013. Tonight we're talking lessons of leadership from the NGO Junior Achievements with Linda McClure and Joanne Bender. Thanks for listening. Welcome to Let's Talk Possibility, where we explore ideas, challenge thinking, and inspire action. I'm Talana Simpson, and with me is John Dix. Hi, good evening. Leadership is important for a not-for-profit organization to be sustainable and achieve its mission. Junior Achievement South Africa is an, is an example of this. What can we learn from its leadership to better run other organizations? With us is the Managing Director of Junior Achievement South Africa, Linda McClure. That's correct. <laughs> who is also a founding director of one of Africa's leading business schools, the Gordon Institute of Business Science. And Joanne Bender is also with us, and she's the National Programs Manager of Junior Achievement South Africa, and is also a Junior Achievement alumni from her high school days in the US. <laughs> So welcome, and um, maybe Joanne, you can tell us a bit more about what does um, Junior Achievement actually do? What are they about? Well, what was your intro you, uh, the, to the possibility? You, you said Where we explore ideas, challenge thinking, and inspire action. That's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. That's exactly can what Can I say that you're a copycat? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, we are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think we've been doing it in the U.S. since 1990. 1919. 1919. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and for 33 years in South Africa. So we've been here since 1979. And uh, we, we run programs in primary school, high school, and now out of school. That, uh, on, we do teach entrepreneurial skills, uh, how to start a business, how to do the paperwork, how to mm -hmm. do market research. But we take the blinders that are very narrow in scope of a lot of our participants and we widen them as much as possible to open up possibilities for them. Uh, we teach them or we expose them to a situation of cooperation, collaboration, because they work in teams of okay. people, and taking nothing or a small investment and making it into something, rather than expecting someone else to give something first before they can do something. So we're turning mm -hmm. around mindsets and really cultivating entrepreneurial thinking. So statistically speaking, many of our participants won't actually go on and become entrepreneurs, uh, but they can use the experiences they've had with us. They can apply those um, skills and, and, and their experiences to university or further education or a job mm -hmm. or maybe later in life they'll go, I remember I, did, I was involved in a small business and we made money and maybe I'll try it again now when I'm 30 or 35 or whatever. So we really we change mindsets and we open possibilities. So so with you being an alumni, so you actually went through the program, it, as you said, in, in high school. Yeah, a very long time ago. What did you <laughs> take from that? Because I know you, you're, part of your career is you run your own consultancy for many years. And, and yeah, I think, I think in my case, um, because I was, I was raised in a family of entrepreneurs. My, my father uh, bought a grocery store from his father. My mother ran a restaurant that her mother-in-law started. Uh, so I grew up in a family business. So I enjoyed the Junior Achievement Program because I enjoy people and we were working in mm. teams and we were doing that kind of thing. Uh, but I think I learned most of what I appreciate about being an entrepreneur, I learned from my father and my mother. Right. <laughs> so it's a good exposure there. Yeah. You talk about entrepreneurial thinking, is that quite an important process in terms of entrepreneurial thinking, the parent relationship? I think it certainly uh, helps, but I don't think you have to have that. Mm -hmm. um, certainly if you see, it's like having any sort of mentors in your life, whether it's a relative or somebody you know, your neighbor, or anyone in your neighborhood, yeah. uh, your community. Uh, you can look at them and, and see how they're seeing the possibilities uh, and the, the solutions or the possible solutions rather than just the problems. Yeah. Yeah. Just to go back to the uh, leadership, you know, when when JA started in 1979, I mean, it's, it's quite an amazing story that it was Dr. Steve Black, it was under the auspices of its business school at that stage. And I mean, he looked at the unemployment situation in the country and, and learned about what the, the program that had started in the States or was running in the States and brought it across. And um, I mean, he was at that stage absolutely determined to mix uh, black and white kids. 
Mm. So he, against all odds, at a, obviously mm. a very, very difficult, difficult time in the country, uh, he would go into the townships and, and pick up black kids from schools and bring them into the white, tr traditionally mm. white areas and run these programs and, uh, you know, was visited by the security police and et cetera, you know, and he, and he just carried on. So, I mean, that's, that's amazing leadership. And there's a, a lovely story about, um, you know, with all the uprisings in the schools and that at that stage of a, a young girl in, in uh, Cape Town, I think it was, who said that there was a particular year where she, re she received no other education other than the Junior Achievement Program, you know. So, sure. I mean, that's, that's pretty remarkable that somebody just took this on, you know, and yeah. um, against all odds said, I'm going to do this. And look at it now, 32 years now. later. It's, yeah. You've got, I mean, just Still on your website, strong. you've got some wonderful mm. success stories, guys. You've really got some really cool ideas and initiatives taking it further or have learned from their experience, which is, mm. yeah. which is very encouraging. Yeah. And we don't know all of them. You know, we it's quite difficult to keep track of, of all the... The participants on our programs over the years, you know, they drift off and, uh, but I mean, you meet them all the time and mm. it's, it's always a positive, they're always, I've never had anybody saying anything negative about their experience mm. and they remembered all, mm. everything about it. And I don't think it happens uh, necessarily immediately that right after they come out of the program, no, uh, we, we work a lot with 10th, 10th grade and 11th grade and then of course there's <laughs> the matric year that they go through and then, mm. you know, their involvement with us is a little bit less. But even if five years or six years after mm -hmm. they're out of matric, the, then they pick up something. You know, they pick up, up an idea or they take an attitude that they've, they've learned. Yeah. There's a maturity level in this as well. Yeah. 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 Uh, Chris, Chris Stikes, one yes. of you, he's a J alumni. Ah. <laughs> oh, no, no. There you go. That's where you got the possibilities <laughs> angle from, I see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so Junior Achievement is, is a very successful organization. I mean, you've been around for, yeah. as you said, for... 33 years, yeah. For a long... 93 year. in globally. 93 mm. globally. So that's a, a long time for an organization to be, mm. so, you know, so you're obviously NGO sustainable. Especially. Yeah. Yeah, not yeah. for profit. Yeah. So what do you believe has actually contributed to, to that success? I think... Uh, I mean, obviously, even in South Africa, there have been, you know, ups and downs, and, mm. and sometimes it hasn't been doing as well as it, it could have been doing. But um, there have been a, a couple of people that have really just steered the ship right the way through. You know, we've got um, our fi one finance uh, director, Abdul Roger. I mean, he's been with the organization for 20 years. Nelly's been with the organization also in finance for 19. 18, 19 years. Mm. Yeah. And so I think in all the, the ups and downs, I think because they so firmly believed in what we do, and, and I mean, Abdul, was, he's just been, you know, this, this is this organization that does really great work, and he's just kept steering it in the right direction and, of course, managed the money extremely well. And I think that's, I was just, as you were introducing, just thinking about some of these things, that the problem with NGOs is that if you, if you really are so desperate for the money, and so many NGOs are, and mm. it's becoming worse, that, uh, you know, some organizations will start sort of deviating from their core business and, and taking on projects that are, it's, it's really not their core business, but they need the money. I mean, I've refused money, you know, if, if uh, we're in a position to be able to do that, that... Um, but thank you to Abdul for, for having looked after the money so well, that if somebody comes along and asks me to run an HIV and AIDS education program, I won't do it. It's not what we do. Yeah. Or if a funder has, has asked for uh, specific requirements or the, the, the agreement or the grant request is so restrictive, I won't do it. Um, and, and I think that's, that's really s stick to, to what you do and don't take on, don't take on money or, or uh, partnerships if it's not going to work. Uh, and it's not it's not sticking to your real business. But Stick to your business. There's also um, because we're strong financially, mm -hmm. and we can have we can operate from that position. Um, sometimes uh, we'll be asked to do things, and it might compromise the quality of the program. Yeah. Because we're going so much for how many how many learners can we reach rather than the quality of what we're giving them. Mm -hmm. So I think there's choices that we make there as well, yeah. that we won't compromise the quality no. of, no. of the programs that we give. And that's really, the learners are always the first 
Absolutely. First Absolutely. And, yeah. and so they should be. Exactly. Yeah. The benef- no, exactly. And just, just in case people out there think that we've got millions and millions of brand, we <laughs> you don't. You always use more funding. <laughs> we, I mean, we have built up an endowment over the years. So that's yeah. what I mean by being strong financially. But we don't touch that money. You know, I fundraise every year for yeah. money to run the programs for but the that's year. That's rare for, I think, non for profit organizations that are Extremely. able to be in that position. I think, it is. I think mm. you talked about having good quality people in place. I mean, mm. some of that comes from from having good leaders at identifying the right people and making sure that their skills are best used. And also, I, I, being visionary, uh, being able to to see where where the NGO area or what's you know what's what's happening in the field and 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 with um, the change in government and that type of thing. So I mean, I. I just think there's a, there's a particular NGO that, that has been around for a very long time that have had to completely downsize. And, I mean, they're a very good NGO, but they had, they had high overheads. They had a lot of full-time staff. They had um, people around the country all full-time employed, but they were solely reliant on government funding, and the government funding pulled out. And so you just got to, firstly, you know, we had a very good leadership. Um, even uh, I've been with JA for seven or eight years, and before my time, we had offices in, in other areas. But the board and, and the, the staff at the time saw, you know, that the writing was on the wall that you can't have such heavy overhead. Mm-hmm. So that was all cut right back. So we've got a very small team of 11 full-time members of staff in, in Johannesburg, and everybody else works on a contract basis. So if I don't have money to run programs in Durban, the, the, the yeah, women, pay we're not paying stuff. them. Yeah. We're lean and mean. So we are lean and mean, <laughs> yeah. So and we're not flippy floppy. No. <laughs> no, <laughs> we're very also, professional. Which is mm. also important. Very, mm. very professional. What do you mean by flippy floppy? Well, um, maybe we'll get it done now, but you know, if we don't get around to it till next month, it's okay. Yeah. Because, you know. Oh, the proposals want to, you know, that company wants a proposal, oh, I'll do it next week, you know. I mean, we run, uh, governance wise, we are incredibly strict, you know. Our governance is just squeaky, squeaky clean. Our audits are clean mm-hmm. every year by Deloitte, so, you know, it's not um, so your buddy good, down the road. Good systems in place. Very. Very, yeah. And we run very professionally, you know. We, we're pretty slick. I think we surprised a quasi-government organization last year <laughs> because they wanted to, to partner with us. And, I mean, we did. And they had been talking about this project for about three years, and then they started talking to us about doing the one part, and we did it. And I think, we haven't, we haven't heard from them since. <laughs> <laughs> Too efficient it was a bit of a surprise, you know. <laughs> so being professional and visionary leaders, so so mm. leaders who can actually have a vision and stick to it, it sounds like, mm. and, and guide. So something, and then also part of that must be communication in the way you lead, the way you're able to then pass that vision from, I mean, you've, you're on the board as well. Yeah. And so how, do you, how do you team. pass that down? Yeah, so well, you better ask her. Yeah. I mean, I have to get, I have to pass okay. it on to her so she can answer that. Her, this. Joanne. <laughs> picture the scene. Pretty, pretty much, the programs team is in an open plan office. Okay. Linda's office is kind of, and then from the office, you'll hear you'll hear her yell, <laughs> Joanne. I never do that. I come out of my office and say, "Have you got a minute?" <laughs> or whatever. We communicate constantly. Mm. Constantly, and everybody yeah. in the office communicates constantly. So we always know what what's going on. Mm. Everybody in the organization knows, uh, you know, what we're doing, what projects are on the go. You know, it's, so, it's so just there's no holding on to information and protecting no, it. It's, it no. sounds like it's much more open and yeah. sharing. And in fact, it's very transparent. You know, when I started at JA, I was I was very surprised that. On a, a monthly basis, the financials are sent around to every member of staff. I mean, obviously, salaries aren't divulged, but there's the salary line item. But the income and expenditure statement and where, you know, where the funding's coming from and what's pending and what's in and what we're still waiting for mm. and et cetera. I mean, I don't think any of the staff look at it, but they all get it. You know, and I was quite surprised at that. And, and they're all welcome to ask questions. So yeah. there's complete transparency. But it's also, well, I don't know... Um, Look, the programs team is the largest number of people in the organization, mm. and I think we are very team-oriented. Mm. Um, 
and yeah, team oriented. And, and that's one of your strengths, Jane, is is um, leading a team and helping them make sure that you stay on track. I think so. Do, so how do you do that? <laughs> what is your leadership style then, if you were to, I think to thing, call it something or yeah, describe it? When I was in university, and then just out of university, I was involved in uh, theater in the U.S., so I was a stage manager. Mm -hmm. And I also had to manage volunteers. And so if you have to man uh, manage volunteers, that's the best management training that you can get because they can leave at any time. Yeah. And the one rule that was taught to me when I, I think I was 19 uh, by the lighting designer that I was working with, but I was managing the volunteers on the lighting crew. And he said, never ask anybody to do anything you wouldn't be, pre be prepared mm. to do yourself. Mm. So it's that viewpoint. Mm. It's, you know, I'm not going to do the, the, the detailed jobs that my team members do, but I have to be always prepared to do. I can't mm. have them do the grunt work and not be prepared to do it myself. And it's just that kind of, everybody's in it together. And we all have something to contribute. Mm. And finding people's strengths and having them work to their strengths so that they're happy. And laughing a lot and shooting rubber bands in the office and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a kind crucial, crucial role. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's a family. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, yeah, I'd go with that. I think my style is, is probably the same. I wouldn't, I wouldn't ask anybody to do anything that I wouldn't do. There's some things I don't necessarily want to do, but um, I wouldn't ask somebody to do something I'm not prepared to do. And I think, you know, it's quite a juggling role that, that, that you have in an NGO environment because, you know, you've got quite a few stakeholders that you have to keep happy. Um, I mean, you've got, I mean, Joanne is so, so critical. Um, for what we do, so mm -hmm. I would never, I would never impose anything on her. Uh, you know, I, I will always be aware of what the programs team will come back with. I mean, there are times where you'll have to say, look, you know, it's just the way we have to do it. You know, it might not be ideal, but you just have to do it that way. I mean, we have a particular grant at the moment that is is a little bit like that. Um, but I think it's yeah, I think it's understanding the limitations, um, and and but, but to juggle. You've really got to juggle the funder. You've got to juggle your your, um, your constituents, team. I suppose, the, the students that we have on our programs, and they're absolutely key. Uh, the team, you know, the board. So it's quite a quite so a juggling a at the two. <laughs> and keeps on telling me, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm very, yeah, I would never have thought that I was good at politics, but it is a bit of a juggle, you know. Well, it's um, understanding the the players and it's understanding how they relate to each other. Linda's one of the best fundraisers I know, and I've been working with nonprofits since I was nineteen. Um, so it's understanding those relationships, <laughs> actually. And it's funny because we were talking about it the other day, whereas if I have to sit behind my computer and not interact with people for too long, like mm -hmm. for two hours, that's like getting to be too much. <laughs> <laughs> then I have to like have a conversation and find out what's going on and, you know, have some interaction with the team. So it speaks to your personality as well. Mm. And then, mm. but, but Linda can sit in her office all day. Can I? You can. I think you do. <laughs> <laughs> and hide away and research away. And yeah, I suppose it's a bit of a juggle, you know. I mean, I can, it's a bit of both for me, you know. I don't think I could do that for days and days on end. But yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm quite happy sometimes to just, I did it on Friday, you know, really yeah. in the main. I was just in my office checking out things and doing what research you needed to and do. yeah, yeah. Um, just got to get that balance. It's about getting the balance, I think. Yeah. And getting other people to you know, sort of to drive with you, uh, how do you get them to buy into your vision, or do you incentivize them? Is it is it is it a passion Which of theirs? The people sort of maybe the just the below persuasion you. side, mm. I suppose. Yeah. Mm. How do you persuade people? So, so do you, you, you you talk of a team, you talk of a family. How do you get them to pull together as a family? Yeah. Look, I think um, because you guys are at a top level, you've got the vision, you can see yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. How do you? But, but everybody on the team, uh, well, speaking for the programs team in any case, which in our office, there's one, two, three, four, five on the programs team. Mm. Uh, then, then there's agents throughout the country who work on a contract basis. And then within Gauteng, we have our facilitators who work with us who are also on a contract basis. But for the, at least the five who are permanently employed in the office and our but eight agents that we have throughout the country, mm. they're all extremely passionate about what we mm. do. So they're there already. It's the not passion is a huge 
absolutely, absolutely. Well, absolutely. And then the, the leader yeah. being able to identify yeah. that passion and yeah, if they yeah. Didn't, I, I think uh, when we had our mm-hmm. agents meeting, we get everybody together once a year, and and I think I asked them, you know, why do we do this? Because sometimes we get so focused on numbers and reports and all the, mm-hmm. the black and white things we have to report on as in management. Client stat feedback. Yeah. Well, all that yeah. stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and so I asked them, why do we do? Why does each one do what they do? Mm-hmm. And every one of them <coughs> said it's because of the learner. It's because we're, you know, we're just enriching lives. And I don't, they weren't making it up. No. They, were, they were genuine. Uh, and yeah. that's, that's the first ingredient to what you're talking about. Okay. And then it's just a matter of not squashing that. Hmm. And just keeping it alive. And that's easy to do if you allow everybody to do what their strengths are so that they enjoy what they do. And so then leading becomes quite, you almost lead from behind. They allow them to grow and develop on their own with a bit of guidance here or there. Yeah, look, Would I don't like to. That? I don't yeah. like to work too hard, so I. <laughs> <laughs> so it's more like being a conductor. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I think we're lucky. I mean, we we really do have a a very good team. I mean, each have different skills, sure. you know, and uh, you know, you just make yeah. sure they're working to their skills. No, but exactly. I don't think there's any member of our team at all who's not extremely passionate about what they do. And I've, I mean, you and I have spoken about it quite recently. I don't get out enough, you know. So I probably do experience, um, yeah, I mean, not to say the program team doesn't. We work in a very, very difficult space. Um, you know, working in the school environment can be really challenging, uh, you know, and all the complications that come with that, working in the education system. The out-of-school market is a new market we're going into. You know, we're grappling to, to where do we find the right students. You know, obviously, I've got the big fundraising drive all the time. And I think it's important that I should actually be getting out there more as well. You know, and I actually thought about it over the weekend. So that on a, a program, Yeah, I think on a monthly basis, I need to get to a program. Because I tell you, you just have to go to one of those programs and... You're yeah. okay for yes. a while. It, yeah. <laughs> it feeds you. It does. It does. That, that it does. I mean, yeah. So it sounds like then if, if part of the role of, of, of you as leadership is is helping your, your the people who work with you to work to their strengths, there's a level of awareness there. Mm. I mean, you obviously got to work out what, what the people you're working with are, are good at. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so yeah, Anne's very good at that. Awareness is a big part of what we do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Always aware. Yeah. And present. Yeah. Present and aware of what's happening. Yeah. Uh, okay. And what are, sorry, and, and that goes with, because, the, the, yeah, and that goes with our leadership style in, in within our own uh, team in the office, but also, you know, working with schools and working with learners and always being aware of what's what's going on and being sensitive to what's going on. Mm, and in tune and obviously responsive. Absolutely. Yeah, you have way. to be. And then what, what about, I was going to ask, the next question is to be self-aware. Because there's a lot of awareness about what's happening outside of you. Always self-aware. But, but yeah. how, much work, how much work do you do on yourselves? If I, you don't mind me asking. I mean, you, want to, you want to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> we'll answer for you. Uh, you answer yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's this man named Eckhart Tolle. Y- yeah, it's <laughs> a lot. Mm. Is, uh, I had the privilege of spending a week with him number of years ago, oh, wow. and that's where it started, <laughs> or that's where it really uh, became ingrained. So yeah, so being present, um, focusing more inward than outward. Mm. Uh, Answering tough questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think that's where we, we, we work very well together, mm. you know, because, um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, we both have, have difficult aspects of our work that we have to deal with, but... Not to say you don't, but I mean, I, I have some particularly tough areas that, that require management. And it's, it's very good to have somebody like Joanne, who's a very wise woman, to just bounce something off. And she calms me down as well, you know. It's like so that peer network is also very important. Very. Even if it's, and do you, do, you, do you seek help and guidance outside of um, junior achievement? Do you look at... I mean, do you have your own mentors, for example, that you could also bounce ideas off? No, no. And, um, I mean, until Joanne joined the, the team, it can be quite lonely, you know. You've got, I mean, that is, that is quite a big thing as well, that if you're leading an organization like this, 
I mean, I was lucky that uh, I had a couple of team members that I could always speak to. But mm. to a large extent, you know, you, if you're having, if you're struggling with something, it's quite difficult to go to your board. I mean, they've appointed you, and and you have. To and we actually have a question that has just come in. Maybe we can go there. Um, Papal has asked, what leadership characteristics are specific to an NGO? So we've spoken a lot about mm. just leading, but is there anything else that you would say if anyone is thinking of organizing or starting an NGO or is currently leading one, that they specifically should try and develop or grow? Hair on your teeth. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean by that? Yeah, you know, it's... Uh, uh, let me think, you know... Um, Well, if I can just before you before you answer, mm. I think I think in any business, I mean, integrity is hugely important. Mm. But um, I think it it's not about. <laughs> one of my friends in the U.S. said once that it when it becomes more about the individual who's leading than it is about mm. the organization. Mm. You have to you have to mm. separate. I mean, it's not about you who's leading the organization. This is it's a community, and it's not your money. And it's not profits. Mm. It's mm. it's the community's money. Um, so, it, it, I, and I think that's a very yeah. very important distinction. Yeah. And and that with my bit of reading around leadership is what is style or philosophy of leadership that they call servant leadership. Mm. It's understanding that you're there to serve the people mm. that have elected you mm. into that that it's position yeah. of, of leadership. It's what a lot of politicians forget. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah and you you know as, as I mentioned earlier, you've really got to have a very clear vision. And you do need to stick to that vision. You know, you you try not to deviate. And I'm not saying that you don't ever, you're not ever flexible. You know, lots of companies have um, gone bankrupt for for you know not being flexible. But if you are really firmly, be if you firmly believe in what you're doing, that's what you stick to. Yeah. You know, um, and just being aware all the time. But you stick to that. I think. Uh, I think one of the key things is, is you've really got to have extremely, extremely good interpersonal skills uh, because people give money to people. They don't give money to organizations. Yeah. Um, and it's all about relationships. You've just, you've got to build your relationships. And mm -hmm. then referring to that YouTube, or to the uh, TED Talks. Yes. What was the man's name? Dan Pilotta. Yes. Pilotta, yeah. About how, you know, non non for profit, it's. But they get rewarded more for how little they, how little money they spend, yes. and not for you know the amount of good that they do. Yeah. So it's not having a minimalist attitude towards what you do, but thinking big, and, yes. and not being afraid to spend money. Yeah. To, mm. If it if it's going to benefit your beneficiaries. Yeah. Yeah. It's not being small-minded <laughs> or small. Not having it's a small vision. Yes. Yes. You know, yes. Dream big. Yes, exactly, exactly. And stick to that. Um, you know, obviously the the ability to work in a team, you mm -hmm. know, it's uh, uh, very difficult to run an organization, well, I think any organization, but very difficult to run an organization like this if you if it's your way or no way, you know, it, it, it just doesn't work, you know. And I mean, I my, I don't think it works any any in any organization. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's, it's quite interesting. The question is, you know, about about leading an NGO, but the reality is it's it's a business like any other, you know. Um, oh, probably more challenging. And don't you think, though, also, uh, you said that people give money to individuals, not organizations, mm. but also when you're asking for money, when somebody says no, you can't take it personally. Yeah, exactly. That's, uh, yeah, that's what I was going to say about hair mm. on your teeth. And, and, and I, I struggled with that in the beginning, you know, <laughs> that, you, do, you, know, in the, you know, for the first six months, you take it extremely personally. Um, but you've got to get over that. You know, that's, you've still got to just like, you know. And don't be afraid to ask. Make the ask. Now, that's, that's, that's <laughs> yes. an important thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A lot of... Well, a lot of ask, you'll never know. It's yeah, but a lot of funders, you know, they'll say, don't, you know, you go in and, and, yeah, you do all your little blurb. You know, it's like, tell me what you want from me. Mm. Yeah. You know, just ask. Be and don't be, and don't be yeah, yeah, be specific and don't be scared to ask. Mm. Uh, and don't say, well, if you can spare 10,000 rand, say, I need a million rand. They can only say no, or give you half. Yeah. You know, just just be specific about what you're asking. Yeah. Hmm. hmm. Well, I think there's got a lot for us to think about. Um, <laughs> well, there's yeah, there's use. quite a few leadership traits that you need to bring mm. to the table. I mean, yeah. And as, a, and as a managing director, it's, it's getting the right balance. Yeah. Um, yeah. But also having a, an incredible team with you. 
that you can bounce ideas off and then that you can run with your own initiatives. And yeah. You can focus on your... So, you know, the ship doesn't sink when you're the captain's yeah. on land. The yeah. captain's on land fundraising. Yeah. The ship is <laughs> going to be continuing with the programs, whatever else needs to happen. Yeah. And, and listen, sometimes I'm not so good at that, but, but uh, I've been told. <laughs> um, but, I mean, really listen and, and take people along with you. You yeah. know, your, your team need to know what's going on uh, uh, across uh, across every aspect. If there's something that's not so nice to hear, they need to know that too. Yeah. It's just people, they, they need to understand. And, and, you know, you asked about how you, you keep them with you. I think that's really key. They, they Take them into your confidence, you yeah. know. They need to know what's happening and, and what the issues Why are. Why they're there. Yeah. They're there. So I think, yeah. I think our team, well, they, I think they know pretty much everything that I'm doing and where I'm at and... and you know, the transparency. Yeah, yeah. Dan, we've got another question that's just come in from ASMA. I don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> the NGO sector play a very important role in society. Should our government not be doing more to assist this, se this sector? Maybe just a sure, comment on that that's before we wrap up. Controversial, could be a controversial <laughs> discussion. Absolutely. I think, I think civil society in South Africa is being marginalized. Um, I mean, there's all sorts of theories about why it's being marginalized, but no, I don't think they're given um, the space. I don't think they're given the time. Uh, they're certainly not being given the money. And um, they do have a very important role to play. I mean, if you look at the, the role of civil society in, in South Africa over the past few years, you know, I mean, it was it was civil society that really that overthrew the government, you know, and um, and I think maybe that's sort of like it can, it can be a little bit scary for people, but yeah, no, I don't think I don't think civil society is taken seriously enough in this country, and and does need to be listened to a lot more. After the listening, because talk is invariably cheap. And reacting, yeah. you know. Um, I mean, you just take that example of the, the textbook saga in Limpopo. I mean, that wouldn't have come to anybody's attention if, if it hadn't been for that that NGO. What are they, Section 21? 21. 21. Yeah. I mean, they brought it to people's attention. If they had not started, you know, shouting about, uh, about that, that, you know, nothing would yeah. ever have happened. I mean, there was a lot of, you know, backtracking and backpedaling and... Uh, pointing of fingers by government, but nobody would have known about that yeah. if if Section 21 hadn't decided to actually fight that. And I think that happens all the time. But that's where you you do have to just you know be be strong in your convictions and just say uh, you know this is what needs to be done and 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 be be strong about it. Be strong in what you're mm -hmm. doing. Um, no, but I, I think that civil society, I mean, you can see it. There's some really, really good organizations that are, I mean, we've got Adasa that's uh, closing down, you know, um, and Project Literacy has been struggling. Uh, you know, organizations have been going for a tremendously long time. They play an incredibly critical role, and they're just losing support. So, yeah, and I think it would be a, it's, it's one of those things that you don't, you don't, you can't always quantify or, or put a value on, on the work that civil society and NGOs do in a, in a society. Yeah. But watch it if they weren't there. Uh, so if yeah, you took the, them all the away, then you, you'd, no, you'd notice that they weren't there. Great. Well, to find out more about our guests, you can look at their profiles on our website, ltp.letstalknetwork.tv. And perhaps one way for people to get hold of you, Linda? Would be the best uh, yeah, I think on the website all our contact details are there. Uh, www.jasa.org.za. All the contact details are there. Did anyone add? I don't no? think so. <laughs> <laughs> so. Maybe then just, just to wrap up, what's, what's one of the exciting projects that are coming up for? Oh, wow. Jessa. Oh. Oh. Just your next, yeah. your Is next one. Just, you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just in a nutshell, something. Uh, yeah, we're updating our materials that we use in one of our, well, in two of our high school programs. So we're going to make it more picture-based. Uh, so we're trying to bring it more modernized. Uh, Less more of a linear way of yeah, teaching. more interactive uh, so it can be ready to go on an e-learning platform if, if we choose to go that way. Mm. Oh, e-learning. Mm. Cool. Yeah, well, sh cool. share with your views with us and tell us what you think about um, NGO, the sector, and leadership specifically in that, that area. Tell us on Facebook or tweet us at LT Possibility. 
Next week's topic, we are actually talking to Guy Kawasaki about how to self-publish if you want mm. to create your own book. Join us next week. But until then, from me, Talana Simpson, and all of us here on Let's Talk Possibility, have a great week and go share the possibilities.